Welcome to theCUBE here in the NYSC location. CUBE East, I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. We are here for Media Week, this all week here, breaking down all the hottest growth startups in AI. The AI leaders on the East Coast, we did a session in California in our Palo Alto studios. We're kicking off the week here. Jay Carr is here, the CEO of Arcus. CUBE alumni, last time was on theCUBE, was at VMware Explore, I called it VMworld back then. Shikhar, yes, great to see you. Indeed, great um, to see you again. John. Key, you're your, found, your founding partner over there at Arcus is here as well. Great to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you for so having you're, me. So you're involved in Arcus, which is a, um, a startup that's been baking out for a while, obviously in the networking area, which we're going to go deep in, a deep dive into. Um, I, I want to get into the super cycle we're in. Yeah. And some people don't like the word. I actually like the word because last time we had a super cycle in networking, you, know, you go back to 1986, that 10 year period from 1986 to 1996, yep. really probably was one of the biggest transitions in the history of, of computing and networking. We went from proprietary to open systems and the rest is history. Cisco was formed in 84, they were two years in, they hit that wave perfectly and then that spawned a massive revolution yep. of wealth creation, entrepreneurship, uh, technology innovation, all grounded in open systems that was precursor to the web. The web hit the scene, and then, again, the goodness of open continues to thrive. We are in a similar super cycle right now, and so for the next 10 years, we look out, and just put a mark in time, just say the chat GPT moments, go back two years, just say two years in, or now, whatever. Yeah. For the next 10 years. Indeed. And that's why people are saying it feels like the 90s. So you yeah. talk to anyone around it, NVIDIA, Arcus, this is huge, and you've yeah. been through the movie before. I have indeed, yeah. yeah. Tell us what your reaction is to this well, super cycle. So I think uh, absolutely, as you characterized it, uh, internet, web, it sort of drove the last generation. Uh, there was clearly a shift in compute. Uh, I mean, we went from servers to virtualization to cloud. Uh, we absolutely had a networking boom, kind of when Sun Computers and all these guys came out and took advantage of uh, better networking. Uh, I think AI is obviously now the next great uh, buzz, but also the reality of how things are going to get evolved. Uh, calls for a, a real refresh in terms of how the underlying plumbing and networking is working. So I see this as a moment in time where we're all going to look back about 10 years from now and yeah. say, wow, that was the time when in fact Network took the next giant leap. You had an event last night, private event here at the NYSC. Yeah. You had a lot of investors, you had a lot of potential customers there, maybe even some customers. We really, really weren't checking on that. But for the most part, you know, you are you're one of those companies where it's like you are in the right area. You know, yeah. the old expression, the world spins to your doorstep. Yeah. Um, explain Arcus, you guys were founded um, pre-AI AI moment, yeah. but you guys were really doing in some really hardcore work, ex Cisco pedigree. A lot of background in networking. You were at VMware, you ran all that. I think you did the Nasira deal, if I remember correctly, and that's yes. where, that created NSX as we know it. And yeah. So you were, you were on that side of that telco side. Yeah. Now you got the networking all coming together. This is where the action is. Yeah. Talk about Arcus, why it was founded, and what you guys are doing right now. Yeah, so uh, if I just kind of flash back a bit to the VMware moment, if you look at what VMware did really well, we created an abstraction on compute. It allowed for people to bring different kinds of compute workloads on top of different hardware infrastructures and then make it a plain, uh, uh, playing field, level playing field for everyone to go and uh, become applications on top of this infrastructure. What Arcus has been doing, and this is the reason why I loved the company when I came on board as CEO from VMware, is it had been building already a platform with an abstraction layer that essentially allowed for different network functions and workloads to be dropped on different forms, form factors and forms of hardware underneath. So very similar to the VMware value proposition but brought now to networking. And if you look at how networking has evolved over the 80s, 90s, 2000s and 2010s, mm -hmm. It has really lagged how compute has evolved. So you have a very efficient compute infrastructure, everything from on-prem to cloud. We're now into high-performance computing, GPUs, et cetera. But if you look at what's happening in network, pretty much every CTO, CIO still buys a box, and the box comes from some large incumbent vendor, and they don't quite have the flexibility and ability to go in and stitch these things together with a common yeah. abstraction. So Arcus started out as a company that said, look, we're going to change the world in networking, yeah. we're going to build that common abstraction, 
and we're going to make it available really to every customer for every application and every use case, which is a very sort of large hurdle, a gigantic monumental task to take on. Yeah. And we've done that, we've done that successfully, and of course today, we're at this moment where we are looking to now grow. You know, there's a lot of um, conversations that has a pretty large, wide aperture that we cover on theCUBE. On, you know, the DevSecOps side, as, as you see that on the software side, open source developers are booming. But the revolution is going on at the compute networking layer, and that's why NVIDIA's stock price is at an all-time high. It's clear that the compute and the GPUs, XPUs, whatever processing units are out there, it's going through a mass change, yep. changeover. Um, we call it clustered systems. It isn't the server box anymore. It's the servers in the chips and yep. around the chips. It's what's around it, it's the ethernet. And so this is uh, really forces your hand at Arcus and the industry in general because everything's getting faster, smaller, cheaper. Yep. Sounds familiar? Yes, exactly. The networking has to be faster and distributed. Indeed. This is the real architectural thing that will probably spawn more investment. So take us through why that's important right now. I mean, obviously NVIDIA's, NVIDIA's an investor in your company, so that's a pretty big deal. Why is it important that this flashpoint of compute and networking and this fabric kind of clustered power is coming, and why is networking so important? Yeah, so I'll kind of break this up into two parts. One is how do you create efficiency within a rack in a data center and then how do you create efficiency in between racks and in between data centers. Both problems are actually super critical and important now. If you think about how uh, in particular infrastructure is deployed, data centers are created, the historical view was to build these racks of general purpose compute and then use them effectively for all kinds of different generic applications that were delivered. Cloud became a big um, uh, injection point and inflection point into how these data centers grew large. Then along came the edge, we talked about edge applications, IOT and what happened at the periphery of both the service providers as well as the enterprises. Uh, but couldn't quite nail a killer use case for the edge. I mean, lots of things happened and people came up with technologies. Now if you think about it, AI essentially becomes a perfect inflection point for all these things to come yeah. together. You can no longer b uh, build just racks and racks of high performance compute infrastructure and look to only network the close proximity clusters and say that our job is done. You really have to take that from there to the top of rack, you've got to connect between racks, between data centers. And so when we look at what we do at Ar Arcus, in particular our ethernet architecture, our contribution to everything from IETF to UEC, et cetera, we see this as a perfect fabric for extending what happens in the core of the AI substrate to a distributed architecture. This also then takes it from core to edge, uh, from uh, data center to uh, the endpoint, from the um, uh, carrier core to the aggregation points and cell site routers. So think about the entire world of network high performance computing now as spreading out and requiring the perfect high efficiency fabric which is where our partnership and investment from NVIDIA, et cetera, comes in as well, because that then brings in the best in yeah. uh, compute and high performance infrastructure to a leader in uh, innovative networking as we are doing at Arcus. NVIDIA obviously is a leader, their stock price you know, is massive, their success has been massive. Jensen Wong said at his last GTC um, conference, um, the democratization of supercomputing is here. Yes. You mentioned HPC, high performance computing. That was also a very narrow business for the highest customers. Boeing wants to design a new wing. Yeah. They'd have to, hours of compute time, almost like sign in and you know use it and then someone else to wait. Now when you have this computer revolution coming with AI, in every era that I've seen in my career over the past 30 plus years, whenever you bring more compute and networking to the table, People take advantage of it. Yeah. And we're seeing that with AI, and the use cases come out, uh, and clearly from that, new use cases and, and probably other workloads. So what is the benefit that's going to come out of this? Because again, we're in a super cycle. The next 10 years will probably be determined by the next five. Yeah. You guys are in the middle of it. Yeah. You guys hope to be that growth. Yeah. What are the use cases? What are those workloads? What's demanding that power? What's going to take advantage of it? I mean, we had some people here at NYSE, but and during Climate Week, doing stuff 
with, with the climate change and the biosphere instrumenting, like yeah. the computing power. Yeah. I mean, first of all, if you look at just the applications of AI, uh, as you have seen probably from numerous reports that come out, I mean, including from um, uh, folks like McKinsey and Goldman Sachs and so on, pretty much every vertical is looking to get the advantage of AI, some that are getting disintermediated pretty quickly and heavily, and others probably a bit slower. But if you think about everything that's happening in financial services, in uh, autonomous uh, driving, uh, mm -hmm. in industrial automation, in oil rigs, et cetera, the entire gamut of what these industries are going through, they're all relying on how you can take AI in general and then Gen AI in particular and then bring that to the advantage of their use cases. Then if you dissect what's happening specifically in the AI world, a lot of the action is actually moving from training to inferencing. Because of course there are giant training models, LLMs, that are already in place and people are improving them or on them. But now the realization is how do you take these large models, how do you then dissect these or complement that with something that's more vertical specific, and then furthermore, geographically, these endpoints and the distribution points and the inference points are all now going to be located in various different places. They could be at the edges, they could be globally distributed. So this then calls for efficiency in the connective tissue and the architecture yeah. and the fabric that brings everything together. So how are you going to ensure that your highly priced GPU compute resources that you now have brought essentially by paying a lot of uh, money to yeah. whoever is supplying those to be used for just the high performance needs. How can you then offload something from there to be computed by, let's say, a smart name? So this is where our work with NVIDIA, bringing Arc OS on top of uh, NVIDIA's yeah. Bluefield uh, DPUs comes in because we're now jointly presenting an architecture to customers that shows how they can not only leverage their GPU stacks, yeah but also take stuff off of it and then do that more efficiently. Then you have the question of how do you take something mm -hmm. and then move it all the way to either a carrier edge or a, a colo edge or an enterprise edge. And that edge can then become a micro data center because it has yeah. the combination of compute network. And then you also then need to interactively then connect to the large model to go in and say, how am I going to train yeah. and basically pass results back and forth at the same yeah. time. So you can now see the importance of why the, the sort of pipes and plumbing and like whatever wires that connect these things together are incredibly or sometimes even more important than the compute stacks on which the GPUs sit on. Yeah. And this is the, uh, the sort of fortuitous moment that we find ourselves because we've been innovating, as you said, <laughs> even before the AI boom came in. So. Yeah, what's interesting is, is that you know, there's always been these networking challenges, you know, routing tables, coherency, flapping, convergence, you know, all these things that are just make packets work. Exactly. Now you complicate that even further when you go to the Gen AI wave where you move up the stack where you have data harmonization. Yep. Harmony is the gift of Gen AI when it's working. Yep. Because you have distributed computing, you mentioned edge cloud on-premise edge, okay, it's awesome. Now, before we get into some of the pedigree on your team and some of the advisors and investors, you also have some top customers. I want to get into those use cases, if you don't mind. Uh, but first, I want to get a little bit technical because my first impression of Arcus when I was doing, um, looking at you guys, wow, you guys look great. I thought you were an overlay network only. It's a technical term. But you're not, you're an underlay and overlay. Kior mentioned that, he yep. was, he's the founder of CTO last night. Why is that important? Because I think this is a distinction that's important because you're working with the, all the chip players, Broadcom, NVIDIA. Yep. You're creating a harmonization layer between yep. systems yep. And, and ultimately enabling applications and data yep. to kind of work together. This is yep. kind of an important, kind of very nuanced point, but it, it does connect the dots for me. Yep. But if you can be an underlay and an overlay, you see a lot. Yep. Why is that important and what's that enable? Yeah, so think about it again. I think the analogy I would have is to a lot of the work we did at VMware. So trying to simplify this a bit, think about us as going as deep as possible into the hardware processor and silicon architecture as we would be allowed to, okay? So to the extent we can work in deep partnerships with the Broadcoms and the NVIDIAs of the world, 
we go down to the primitives and essentially start building out our operating system environment from there up. Mm -hmm. We're building the entire uh, BGP stack, the entire route uh, infrastructure, all homegrown. And these are being done by experts who have done this before for yeah. companies like Cisco and Arista and so on. And so the reason that is important is because we get to have the best of both worlds. If somebody comes up with a processor that's whatever, 800 gig or yeah. uh, terabit uh, uh, speeds, we would take advantage of that and then put our best operating system software on top of that so that the customers get the both, yeah. best of both. On the other hand, if you look at somebody uh, as a customer and they say all we need is a simple switch uh, at one end of our infrastructure and we really want to basically make this a simple whatever, tour or even a management switch, we can effectively narrow down the applicability of our operating system right down to the basics of the silicon and then add that to make this a very very highly performant simple switch. The only way you can do this entire spectrum of architecture all the way from simple switching to complex routing is if you do what I just described. You have to be able to get down to really the nits of yeah. what the hardware architectures offer us. We have to work closely with the hardware vendors in order to be able to do that. And then the benefit of this to customers is they see a, an interface that essentially yeah. they can take comfort in the they fact They can tap into it. They can tap into it, they can basically create yeah. services, they can build functions on top of it. And uh, we are evolving ourselves, so not everything that Arcus yeah. is, has built at the operating system level is already exposed through an API. But as you look at our company growing and as you look at the customers adopting, the fabric itself is becoming yeah. or will become more and more a yeah. basis for our customers yeah. to start programming functions. If I can translate that for the folks that aren't in the, in the networking business, think of like your Windows operating system. Every time a new processor comes out, exactly. it runs faster, gets better. Exactly. They update it quicker. Exactly. You don't have to wait two years for the new version. Exactly. That's been the problem yep. in the past. Yep. You guys are more agile. Yep. You can move your OS around, keep that harmonization, but also take advantage yep. of what's next yep. and have that backward compatibility. Yeah, and we've Is that went, right? uh, absolutely, and inside the OS, and if you dissect this, and we have a nice picture that sh sort of shows you the services that we can break our OS into, there's a component there called the DPAL or uh, abstraction layer for the data plane, and that essentially yeah. allows us to bring the Arcus OS on top of a new hardware pipeline, a new, even a new hardware vendor for that matter, yeah quicker than anybody in the world can do this, yeah. right? I mean, we can do this faster than a Cisco or an Arista or a Juniper. And this allows us to become so tightly collaborative with our customer yeah. that they could come up with a set of new functions and services that they've dreamed up yesterday, bring that list to us, and our engineers are yeah. then able to go in, and if we don't already accommodate that in our OS, then we can actually upgrade that <laughs> to get that in quickly. So. Well, I wish we could go for an hour, uh, but we have a big day ahead of us here at, a, at our media week. Um, let's get into some of the qu other points I want to highlight, because I think it's worth not noting and calling out. Um, you know, they always say, as an investor, you know, big market, great team, Go after it, you're going after a big market, obviously enabling kind of is this super cycle, reminds me of 86 to 96, during which created a massive uh, set of entrepreneurship and wealth creation and, and opportunity and innovation. I think the next 10 years are going to be good, and then that's going to happen in the next five years. Yep. That'll set Indeed. the table for the next 10. Um, you've got a great team. Uh, Key, your, your partner, he's the founder, CTO, ex Cisco, distinguished engineer. He knows networking, so there's no, no doubt there. Your career, you've connected the dots, you've done MA, you've been technical, so you can see the puck that's coming. You skate to where the puck is, another cliche. I love hockey fan, <laughs> Wayne Gretzky, I said that. But you've got some great advisors. I see Basquayers on there. Um, you've got some really big customers, CTO of AT&T. Um, you've got a good, healthy investor. So it's, it's, the, it's almost like you're moving fast in this AI world with the classic, I won't say old school investment thesis, but you know, the, the reliable one. Good partners, yep. funders going to back you, great team. This is going to enable you to get into a lot of customers. Yep. Take me through the, the customer um, value proposition because, again, Cisco took a couple of years to get baked into these companies. Their use case was simple, connect yep. buildings and campuses. Yep. Yep. And next thing you know, 
PCs are on desks, they're connected on LANs, packets are moving, yeah. people are buying switches, the rest is history. What is your version of that in this super cycle? You come in, you knock down a simple use case, why would the CTO of a big bank, big network work with you? I think uh, the foremost use case really is programmability. So if you think about what is happening today, the pace of technology change is tremendously fast. I mean, before you know it, you've gone through cycles of whatever IoT and crypto, and we're into this hopefully long-standing cycle of AI, but things change extremely fast, right? And so you cannot have an infrastructure that is basically a static, non-programmable yeah. legacy box that you find yeah. hard to create, manipulate, change, and make new applications run on top of it. So fundamentally, our customers, and our customers, again, not all of which we can disclose publicly, but for example, um, uh, the, many of the top market cap companies, the top 10 market cap companies, three or four of them are some combination of yeah. customer, partner, investor, or all of the above. These are the kinds of yeah. customers that they are looking at taking the best advantage of all available infrastructure, the latest in technology, and they want to move fast. I mean, they want to build <laughs> yeah. supercomputers fast, they want to build data centers fast, they want to launch applications fast. I mean, right here, right? NYSE training floor, and you know yeah. the speed at which things yeah. move. So programmability coupled with the speed of the underlying infrastructure and the speed of which, uh, at which applications can be created and yeah. launched is paramount and high yeah. importance for all these uh, customers. If you then take it from there, of course, then the next level uh, 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 issues around things like reliability and cost and ability to interoperate and be uh, sort of uh, operate in greenfield and brownfield environments, yeah. um, supply chain, uh, getting diversity across um, vendors and not being locked in. Yeah. These are all value propositions that we also then bring into the table and uh, or on the table and add to the value proposition of our customers. Yeah, I mean, I think data networking was a classic. Data processing was an 80s thing too. All coming back because LLMs and foundation models are being trained now. It's like going to school. Yeah. But once you get out of school, nobody stays in school forever. Yeah. You yeah. go out and you reason in yeah. the real world. Yeah, exactly. And so I think the killer app of inference and agentic systems which will be embedded in applications yeah. is going to have to use data and be harmonized with distributed computing architecture yeah. Yeah. of which exactly. you're enabling. Yeah. I mean, I think you are going to be the killer app from a networking perspective yeah. because the inference has to be done at the point of the human and or device, machine, wearable, whatever you got. Yeah. It's got to have compute and everything kind of tied in there. I mean, this is networking concepts it is, applied absolutely. to data. It is, and uh, if you think about it, a simple sort of switch or router used to be doing just a simple job, right? I mean, switch went on and off, and a router basically kind of sent a packet in one direction, right? I mean, that's really what they did. Now, when you start looking at the technology advances, in particular, we're working with SoftBank on this uh, thing called SRV6 mobile user plane. Uh, and when you look yeah. at the power of the SRV6 mobile user plane, it actually allows you to create things like network slices, et cetera, using an IP-based uh, programming methodology and then deploy that on top of your mobile or 5G infrastructure, yeah. right? So something like that is now enabling customers to go in and deploy an application or a service on their infrastructure by bringing architectural both innovation and simplicity into this network. So this gives you an example of if you had a few yeah. more packet bits to code, you yeah. could impose a lot more policies, both operational and security on top yeah. of that. And this makes your network such a rich environment yeah. for therefore manipulating the workflows yeah. and the data flows that happen at that level. Shikhar, I'm a fan. If you're out there watching and you're in networking, you're going to be important because it's moving up the stack. Gen AI and all the graph and databases are just nodes and arcs. Those are just, those are just going to create more traffic patterns we'll never, that we haven't seen before yeah. that you guys are going to take care of. Thanks for coming on theCUBE here for our Media Week. Appreciate you. Thank you. All right, Cube alumni Wonderful. here inside the Cube studios in the NYSC, part of the NYSC Wired Cube. Open network, of course we're doing wall-to-wall -wall coverage here all week. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. Thanks for watching.